Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Speculation Station. This is episode two. Uh, today, we'll be talking to a couple more uh, local players that play Armada uh, that also went to Worlds for the first time. Today, I am joined by Bodhi, who goes by Bodhi on the Discord. Say hi, Bodhi. Hi, Bodhi. Thank you. I'm also joined by Texas Honey Badger. Howdy. And I'm rejoined again this week with Chris, who will help me conduct this interview. Hello, everyone. All right. And to get off to a good start, we're going to let Chris ask you guys about your experience. Thank you. So I'll start with Bodhi. What brought you into Armada and uh, how long have you been playing? So I've been playing since August ish of 2022. Uh, one of the local game stores where I lived at the time had a used board game sale. And I picked up the core set for 10 whole U.S. dollars. Uh, and I went up to my friend uh, in band, because we were in college band together. And uh, I was just like, hey, do you like tabletop games? And he was like, I've never played one. And we were like, cool. I haven't played one either. And so we sat down in the student union, and we figured out how to play Star Wars Armada. And it was an experience. Since then... I, I guess I've improved a lot, um, but that was the the origin story. I'm I'm jealous you found the core set for ten dollars. That's amazing. It was it was a crazy deal. Uh, they also had some X-wing stuff, but I didn't pick any of that up because Armada's just better. Agreed. Definitely the superior game. Sorry, X-wing players. So, Bodie, as you if, as you've played, uh, you're a relatively newer player. What is your playstyle preference right now, and, and how did you fall into that? Uh, so right out the gate, uh, my friend that I, I started playing with, his name's Ethan, and he wanted to play the Rebel stuff. And so I was like, okay, cool. I'll pick up these plastic triangles, and uh, I played Empire. Um, and because I was the main one, like I owned all of the stuff in the core set, he didn't really have interest in buying anything. And so I kind of just started looking on eBay and I picked up a bunch of things from used lots. Uh, and so the entire collection of both factions was all mine. And uh, from that, I just started experimenting. Um, I, I can't, well, at least I struggled to play the same fleet a lot of times. I... I really want to be able to mix it up and play a whole bunch of different things. So my play style is whatever I'm in the mood for. I think that's that's a good approach to the game in general. You don't want to get stuck with um, one particular thing. Drew, how about you? Uh, what brought you into Armada, and uh, how long have you been playing? Yeah, I um, actually saw all the stuff on a shelf at a local game store in New Braunfels, Texas. Shout out to Game House. Um, the owner there had all the, well, most of the stuff and had a lot of it painted. All of his squads were painted and everything. And so I thought it looked really cool. And then one of my friends bought a used set. He kind of like a game broker. He buys games and then sells them. And uh, I... I talked to him about it. He played X-Wing. I've never played X-Wing. Uh, but he said, yeah, I'll sell it to you for basically what I paid for it. And so I got um, a whole bunch of stuff for like 350 bucks. It was, you know, a bunch of, um, I guess, Wave 1 one and 2 and 3 stuff. I don't really know what the Waves are because I started playing about two years ago uh, after RR2 had already come out. But uh, yeah, a bunch of stuff, and then I bought some stuff here and there to fill in the gaps and ended up buying another secondhand collection. So I've got, you know, like the six Victory Star Destroyers that I flew at Worlds for the <laughs> Sector Fleet. I've just got a bunch of stuff. Um, so uh, that was kind of how I got into it. Uh, like I said, about two years ago, I've been playing competitively for about a year, I think. Texas Open last year was my first real competitive tournament that I played in. Um, other, Well, I played in Gen Con in 2022. That was the first tournament I ever played in. The guy that I bought 
the second hand fleet from he and I went there as a team to play in Axis and Allies and that was earlier and Armada was on the last day and I bought brought my Armada stuff and I just played there and ended up having a blast that's what really hooked me on the game was the community you know I met a lot of people who are big names in the community that I had no idea who they were um all the ion radio guys the command stack guys um all those people and uh it was just a lot of fun and that's really what hooked me on armada was the community um as far as my play style i really like to brawl i just i like to throw dice i like to fly at each other um the opposite of kind of cagey matches I, I don't really care for squadrons i wish they weren't a part of the game but you know we've already expressed our thoughts on x-wing and we don't have to keep repeating <laughs> that so for brawler uh play style you had mentioned victories in the sector fleet what do you is there a specific uh faction who you think is better at brawling or do you just kind of try to find that play style in each faction uh, I think I just kind of try and find that playstyle in each faction. Obviously, um, the Imperials are the best faction. They have the most tools and the biggest guns mm-hmm. and everything. Um, I I like the Starhawk, but really the only way to make it work is a Farmhawk, and I don't like to farm, so I don't really play much Rebels. They don't really have Brawlers other than that. Uh, they're more cagey and... and you know, kind of thematic, but scrappy rebels. Uh, my favorite faction is Gar. I just like the ships. I like the the characters. Um, you know, I grew up in the 90s and the early 2000s when the prequels were released. So those were my childhood, as awful as those movies are. But that's what I grew up with, you know, wanting to be Anakin Skywalker and Obi-Wan Kenobi. Absolutely. So. That's really, um, it's interesting that uh, both you and Bodie, and then we spoke with uh, Ryan and Austin last week that for the people locally that ended up going to Worlds, and when I say locally, I mean Texas, so that's a perspective thing, but uh, that four of y'all are all relatively new players and ended up going, and, you know, just something that has been discussed a little bit here is, you know, like, what is the effect of y'all coming to the game? when there's not really a lot of new content being produced versus, you know, players have been playing since 2017 or whatever. Do you, do you both have any thought uh, about that? Like, has that been uh, a positive for you? Do you think overall? So when I first like saw this core set and I was like, cool star Wars ships, um, I thought that Star Wars Armada, like I had heard the name before and I thought that it was going to be this game that I was jumping into that was continuing to get releases. Um, My only experience with tabletop games was knowing that Warhammer exists and not wanting to have any part in it. Um, Like I, I did not think that I would ever be someone who would paint a miniature, much less build a miniature. And so I saw this stuff that was pre-painted, pre-built, and I figured that I was going to, you know, get another release every now and then. Um, But honestly, like, I think, I think it's kind of fine. Um, It it made it really easy for me to justify spending a lot of money on all of the things that are in the game currently, because I was like, well, now I just own one of everything. And uh, and so I can build any fleet that exists, and that's that's probably not a super healthy thing because you know money and and being a young person in this world. But um, I don't know. I I've never really felt like it's been a huge issue. I I kind of have hope that we'll continue to get organized play initiatives, and we'll continue to get semi-frequent rapid reinforcements or errata changes or whatever. Uh, and I'm more than happy to just wait out uh, new plastic, whether that comes through another company shift or if AMG decides to 
actually produce something. I don't know. I'm I'm just I'm content to wait for the time being. Gotcha. Drew, what about you? Do you think you're coming in into the game new has affected your perspective of the game and kind of how you approach it? Oh, absolutely. Um, I, I agree with everything Bodhi said, and I'm going to answer your question probably a little differently and try not to get myself canceled. But uh, I think there is a huge divide among the community's perspective. I'm not going to say the community's divided. I think the community's great. I think, you know, most everybody I've met playing Armada is a fantastic person, a great sportsman. Uh, I've played other war games before when I was a kid, like uh, WizKids Clicks games, Mage Knight, Mech Warrior, and Hero Clicks. I used to do that every weekend when I was a kid, but um, I I think we hear a lot right now. Armada, the meta in Armada is the healthiest it's ever been. And that's starting to sound like nails on a chalkboard to me, to be honest. I mean, I, I see where they're coming from. You look at when people would fly like eight flotillas and just whale farm or double onager and super oppressive or, you know, as much as I miss him, Commander Ken, RIP and Matchstick. Um, they, they were very overpowered things. And so when people say that, I believe that they're right. But I think when more experienced players who have been around for longer say that, what the perspective they're coming from is the stuff that they like to play is safe. Mm -hmm. And I don't necessarily think that's good for the game. I think if we did shake it up more, and I think that's what the new players want. The new players want new tools, new puzzles to figure out, um, new things to come out. I would love for uh, Gar and Sis to like flesh out their keywords, the droids mm -hmm. and the clones, and be able to compete with the Imperial and the Rebels. And you just don't see it. I mean, if you just look at the, st the stats of... Uh, how many fleets were flown of each faction at Worlds, there's a huge divide. And I think that the people who are happy with the meta now are happy with the meta now because what they're good at is good or what they're comfortable with is good. And you saw it with Commanderkin a lot. Uh, newer players and not even, and some older players too said, you know, hey guys, it's just another thing to figure out. You're going to have to figure out how to play against Commander Ken. You're going to have to figure out the meta with him in, in it. And the older players were, oh, this ruins the game and it's completely broken. And, um, you know, he breaks so many rules. Well, every commander breaks rules. You know, Ramadi doesn't, ignores obstruction and then adds a die for obstruction. That's a broken rule. Uh, Agate gives you a free discard ECM. Like, that's. That's basically just a new tool is a different way to tackle the rule. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I am. I, I would like for, you know, the whatever has been good now and good sense to stop being good. I'd like for something new to rise up. Uh, and whether that's just something like a, a rapid reinforcement that's maybe a little OP until the next one rolls out, mm -hmm. I think it shakes up the game. Now, I, I completely get the argument of negative player experiences, and I don't like negative player experiences. I don't want that to be a part of the game, but, and that's also kind of to each his own. You can complain that Anakin gets to salvo you three times, or you can play Anakin and salvo three times and then just brawl in the middle of the board. Uh, mm -hmm. which is kind of where we're at now. You can complain that like Rebel and Empire Rogues can completely dominate you if you're squadless, or you can play squads and have a plan for them. That makes sense. I can't say I totally disagree with anything you said, and I think it is the nature of the game. Every shift that you're talking about, like, you know, in the pre- flotilla limit days like there's always these swings when new stuff comes out and so yeah we've seen it quite a few times and there's there's always kind of that push and pull of 
this is awesome or oh this really sucks and then it usually balances out fairly quickly i was just glad in the you know the example with anakin that you brought up is that amg you know was listening to the players i think there was a lot of complaining whether justified or not but i, I was glad to see that there was some responsiveness um at trying to tap it down to some degree but then you could argue you know they turned him into basically a different commander so it's always kind of a moving target it seems like i would also like partially agree with uh honey badger i think that the shakeup of the meta that happened from because of anakin's uh appearance like was really like even though it was a little painful it was still was like i think good for the game because it made people really think like how do i solve this problem how do i crack this egg and i will admit i say i partially agree because for me that was kind of a ne negative experience playing against it until i got to the point where i was like you know this is just like me deciding how i'm going to go up against an ssd i can build around it or i can choose to fly away from it but mm -hmm. uh there's always some archetype in the meta that you are going to have to you're going to have a bad matchup against so running away is an option for all that yeah yeah i think I'd, I'd like to believe that this isn't just because Gar is my favorite faction, but there's a lot of overreactions to when Gar gets something good. Like, you think about before the nerf, when Tranquility was three points, you had Mercy Mission, so many people say the Gar Pelta is the best ship in the game, and that Delta Ken is broken and overpowered. Well, last year at Worlds, there were only five Gar players. Mm -hmm. It was like 6% of the list. And that was, you know, before the Tranquility nerf. That was with the best ship in the game in the Pelta. That, you know, Mercy Mission that everyone cries about. But if they're so good, why are more people not playing them? I think the people that do say that they're overpowered just really don't play them and don't know how frustrating it is to try and solve that puzzle when you're on that side. Sure. I have one, like, okay, first of all, I definitely agree that, like, interesting new things need to happen. And as someone who I spend most of my time interacting with the game in the list builder, like, looking at the same permutations of ships, upgrades, and squadrons can get a little bit frustrating, even after only been playing for like two years or so and it, it is pretty rare uh to see a list that like actually surprises me uh like peter's uh starhawk at worlds had a nebulon and that was like holy crap a nebulon um but like all of the other lists in the top eight are like okay we've got an onager and then some combination or sorry no not an isd some other combination of ships and then a bunch of squadrons or like you know here's an akbar list with an assault frigate and an mc30 it's like cool we've seen that and i definitely think that even even the smallest of things like a, a few upgrade cards would improve that experience a lot for everybody like especially the veteran players who have experienced everything that this game has to offer my one only like complaint or i guess um reservation that i have is that amg their track record is like mixed right now and i tend to be a really positive hopeful person and what they did with the errata was mostly really good uh, I think that some of it might have been a bit heavy-handed, but they listened to the players, and that's great. Like, what I think that the ideal situation for a rapid reinforcements type of thing is, is not really something that pushes the boundaries in terms of power level, but pushes the boundaries in terms of, like, just new effects. A Anakin is a frustrating experience because uh he he modified an effect that existed in the game right the salvo 
Um, but like adding a new effect, I think could be a really interesting way to shake things up. I completely agree. Yeah. Well, that was, yeah, there, there's some really good insight in a lot of what was just said. And I want to save some of that for later in the show. Um, as we, uh, get to the elevation status of the program. But from there, uh, Josh, do you want to take over? Yeah, sure. So I would like to take this opportunity actually to ask you, Chris. Uh, so last time I got to talk a little bit about how I got into Armada and some of my play style. But what about you? Uh, how did you get into Armada? And what is your play style, if you, would you say? I started playing probably... The first event that I remember going to is the Battle for Celest, which I think was the transition event f from Wave 1 to Wave 2, right right when MC80s and the ISDs came out. So 2017, I think. And I've just been playing off and on since then, taking extended breaks periodically. Um, but I'd say what brought me into Armada was, I think I saw an ad or somebody, I don't remember how I heard about it, but I started hearing about these FFG games and I was kind of researching Imperial Assault, uh, X-Wing, and Armada kind of all, all at the same time and trying to decide which one to buy. And I, I picked Armada and really never looked back. It's the only miniatures game I've ever played. I love it. It's a lot of fun. It's a good challenge still, which is, you know, I think a testament to the game and how much it, uh, adaptability it has. Uh, just kind of within it. So as far as play style, I'm mainly a rebel player. I've dabbled in Gar, a little bit of CIS. I haven't really played Empire much, so I'd say mainly rebel. Longstanding Akbar uh, fan, but I'm trying to move away from Akbar just because his play style can be a little repetitive. So right now I'm looking at Agate, like everybody else, and then on the Gar side, Bale, and just kind of playing around with those. A lot of squadrons lately, as opposed to uh, no squadrons. That always makes me nervous. So lots of squadrons, either Republic or uh, Rebel at the moment. Okay, cool. Well, now that we know some of the background of uh, each of our podcasters, let's go into our experience at Worlds. So let's start with uh, Honey Badger. I just want to see what fleet did you end up taking? I took a, a four Pelta Venator list, um, and I got there, and a lot of people were like, you didn't bring Pizza Party? Uh, I wanted to bring, bring Pizza Party, but I thought maybe the list that I ended up bringing would be a more well-rounded list. So it was uh, four Peltas, and I got the original idea from, uh, I don't know his real name, uh, Gravinius on Discord. Um, he flew it at a tournament, and then I saw it, and I liked it, and I flew it, and then I liked how it flew, and played from there. But it's it's really tanky. It's Luminara. Uh, I've kind of changed it and made it a little bit my own, but it's still four Peltas and a Venator with Luminara. I did um, Intensify Firepower, uh, Projection Experts on two of the Peltas, Auxiliary Shield teams on the other two, and ECMs on all four of the Peltas. And so really the Ven just sits in the back and plays cleanup and provides IF because Peltas have no dice fixing and they only throw two reds at long range or at medium range. So they really need IF to get consistent damage. All right. Now... This sounds a lot like the fleet I saw at Osmo last year. Did you make any changes from that? I did. Uh, so the fleet that you saw at Osmo was uh, Graven. Uh, I think it's Gravenous. Um, Gravenous's exact fleet. I just I saw it the week before Osmo, and I was like, I'm I'm gonna try that out. It looks fun, and that was similar. But the two back peltas had. Um, they were the Peltas with the blue dice, and they had decaps. So, and they didn't have ECMs because that Pelta doesn't have a defensive retrofit. 
And what I found in playtesting was sometimes people would ignore my front peltas and then just go and try and pick off one of the back peltas and and get away. So I made the decision to switch to um, four of the red black dice peltas, put ECMs on all of them, and then go from there. And uh, it worked out pretty well. I I won one of the Galactic Tacticians leagues tournaments with it and it's a lot of fun um really what ultimately led to my decision to bring it to worlds was i thought maybe people wouldn't have a lot of experience flying against this kind of fleet and in armada experience is everything from what i found if you have a game plan and you're able to stick to your game plan and execute your game plan that you've practiced in dozens of matches and you're going to do well. But if you're faced against something that you've never seen before, you're more likely to make a mistake. And in Armada, you only have six rounds, one round of mistakes. And really, that's that could be a quarter of the game because, you know, the first round is positioning and the last flat round is usually flying away. So it was the intention was to try and get my opponent in a sticky situation and then capitalize on a mistake that they made because they weren't familiar with my fleet. Okay, I got you. Uh, was there any meta that you like built this fleet around or was it specifically built around your brawling playstyle? Uh, it was built around the brawling pr- playstyle with um, an idea to combat squadrons. It... Um, Lumi with ESTs on those peltas and projection experts. It it's a really good fleet into a lot of squadron lists. Um, I ran into a plow list with arcs and that demolished me. But other than you know arcs and plow, double dice bombers and and automatic accuracy, it's really good against most squadron lists. Uh, I like I said, I wanted to bring Pizza Party. I brought Pizza Party for the team tournament for sector fleet uh, i just didn't think it was as good into a heavy squadron meta and i thought there were going to be a lot of squadrons at worlds that's fair i did take a brief look at the uh the stats for worlds i think we'll probably devote some time later on to doing a deep dive but uh there were quite a few squadrons i think squad lists ended up being rather low like under 20 (laughs) percent don't quote me on that either now let's take it over to Bodhi. What fleet did you end up taking to Worlds? I decided on my fleet in the car on the drive to Chicago. It's a bold move. Yeah, I know. Uh, I was on a Grievous hard sell spam list since like January. And the main justification for this is I wanted to cope because Separatists are cool. And... I was like, if I put TRCs on all of these hard cells, then I can spend the evade to set a dice to a devil or a crit, and then I can discard it if their ship's bigger than me to cancel two dice. And then when one of my squadron dies uh, and that comes back with reserve hangar decks, then I get the token back, and that's just value. Unfortunately, it doesn't really work like that. And... uh, Having to fly a bunch of hard cells like straight at your opponent usually ends up in them dying pretty quickly. And because of the way that they're costed, it just didn't feel very efficient to lose a ship. And so while the fleet was really fun, and it's something that I'd like to revisit maybe with a different commander or just later on in the future, I decided that Akbar Sierra 90s have about the same damage output and they're slightly cheaper and you also get to play with stuff that rebel has and so i decided to make the switch over to an akbar list with an assault frigate two cr 90s and a bunch of bombers and things when like literally so the weekend before worlds i had a whole bunch of practice games set up i was gonna learn my new list and then i got sick And so I had exactly one practice game. I guess I had a few before, but I had one actually competitive practice game against Maki online. And in the midst of my coughing fits, I 
got my butt completely handed to me. And so I made the decision, well, actually, he helped me make the decision that I don't really need the fifth activation. I only really need the the three combat ships, and one GR-75 instead of two. And so I played more squadrons. I brought some VCXs and did the little farming thing. There wasn't really a conscious meta choice to bring this fleet. I wasn't planning to face anything in particular. I knew there was going to be a bunch of squadrons, I guess. So I brought A-wings that are good at stalling those squadrons. Uh, but I mainly just wanted to get consistent 7-4s. And farming objectives are pretty efficient at doing that. So that was the plan, and I guess it kind of worked. Okay, cool. It looks like you actually covered all the bases for the questions I was going to ask. But I did want to jump in and say, based on both of your experiences, it seems like the GAR factions, uh, similar to what Will Schick said in his interview with Ion Radio, is that the, the Clone Wars factions are really nice, but they lack flavor. I think they have a bit of flavor. Um, it's just they're missing, they're missing the efficiency that the, the two Civil War factions have. The two Civil War factions have a lot in terms of just like generically good things, whereas in the Clone Wars factions, it's a lot of gimmick and it's a lot of things that you kind of have to push for it to be as just blatantly efficient. There's no price. There's no uh, torn far. There's nothing that's like, just do this thing plain and simple. You have to work for your effects. Yeah, the only real cards that stand out to me when I'm thinking about Clone Wars factions is Wat Tambor, Tickies, and Clone Navigation Officer. And then aside from that, I just think about the commanders, and it's kind of a hodgepodge. You can kind of take whatever you like to get things going. So I kind of agree. see what you mean there. Yeah, they lack uh, utility and tools in their tool belt. And the uh, So Gar is kind of like Empire, and Sis is kind of like Rebels, in my opinion. But... The Separatists don't have a single Speed Force ship, and Gar navigate like bricks. They're absolutely horrible. Whereas Empire has kind of the you know same problem. They have a, a kind of port navigation in some of their ships, but they have things like Jerry to help flesh that out. Or you know you can just take a different ship if you need more mobility. Whereas Gar, they put all their eggs in one basket. Their only four plus squadron pusher is their Venator, which is a hundred point ship and it's large. So now you have to make it a squad pusher and uh, your brawler. And if you're pushing squads, you're not commanding, engineering, and confire and nav, but you're a terrible naver. So something's got to give. They, uh, it, it's like all of their stuff is way too overworked. Yeah, I can see that. I think that might be why Bale gets so much action. 100%. I, I would agree with that. With uh, Bale, he's the commander with the most utility and gives you the most flexibility. Absolutely. I would throw in Jedi Hostage and Mercy Mission, though, as definitely being flavor and having a, an interesting impact on a typical game. But yeah, they're just, they're just they're not complete yet. So, Drew, in your time at uh, Worlds, what sort of fleets did you face? And did you run into anything that really caught you off guard? Uh, I don't think anything really caught me off guard per se. I ran into, I played two KG squadron fleets, two KG like 134s, and an SSD and COG. I lost 3-8. In all of my matches, except for the SSD, I got a 10-1. And really, that was the biggest surprise that I, I hadn't played. I played against one SSD with this list, mm -hmm. and I lost pretty horribly. But I took a different approach this time, and my four Peltas were able to go against the SSD and were able to kill it, while the Vin swung around the back and cleaned up its support. So it was kind of an interesting match. But yeah, I don't, I don't think I really played against anything surprising other than people 
playing cagey and kind of running away and not really engaging. How did you approach, what did you do with the Peltas on the SSD? I'm curious. I'm trying to picture that in my head. I can see the Ven going around. So the Peltas stay in the front or kind of come around left and right? How'd you approach it? Yeah, no, all four Peltas in the front arc. And he had the uh, Eclipse title. Oh, okay. And I just took the face ups. I just, I rammed him and I shot him. And all of my Peltas had ECMs. So he shot at one Pelta and I reduced the damage. And then I was projecting, projection experting. Uh, and he didn't switch targets. And so when the other two projection experts got where they should have been taking the shots, he just kept on that one that he had already shot. And eventually one of the other ones kind of squeaked by and got in his side arc. And so he, he focused down on that one too. But yeah, just being able to ECM every round. I mean, he rolls all his damage and then I just reduce it by half and then they're all uh, repairing and uh, projection experts and parts resupply. Uh, so they were able to do it. The, the four pilters that could with the, the rams and the shots. That's awesome. I, I just love the idea of four pilters going nose to nose with an SSD. Um, and those guard peltas are so much better than the rebel peltas. It's, 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 uh, it's amazing, uh, but they're great. That's fantastic. What about you, Bodie? Did you, um, what, what sort of fleece did you face? And, uh, was there anything you ran into that, uh, surprised you? The most surprising things that I played against, uh, the Spain team, which are awesome guys, had some really unique lists. In day one, in my final round, I played against a... And, and I do not remember any of these names. I'm so sorry. But um, I played against a double Assault Frigate Garm Bell Iblis list with a, a X-Wing Ball. Oh, wow. And Gallant Haven and Biggs and Jan. And so, like, none of his squadrons were ever going to die. And it was incredible. Um, and then in day two, I ended up playing against another guy from Spain, and he had a Sloan MSU list with, like, two gladiators. Um, and so, like, there was some, some really interesting ideas coming from that part of the world. As for other things that I faced, uh, day one, my first round was against someone that I knew but had not played against. And fortunately, I got to start off the day with, you know, a good conversation. I, I didn't have to, like, work into having to interact socially with people that I don't know. Um, but I also got to play against a new list that I hadn't experienced yet. Uh, and that was this Piet list that uses Sovereign uh, to, like, ease the resupplies to put tokens on all your stuff, and then the Sovereign ISD title to turn them into whatever you want, and then Piet turns them into dials. Uh, and it was really interesting. Um, I made the mistake in that game to take a uh, first player because he had demo, and I didn't want him to just tread through my CR90s, but I should have just taken second player and farmed. Um, so that was my only loss in day one. Uh, round two was against another rebel kind of MSUE list. Uh, he had uh, he was cracking with a bunch of CR nineties and some rogues. And uh, the only reason that the game was an eight for me was because in the first few turns, uh, on like sixteen blue dice, he rolled zero hits. Oh wow! It, it was insane. I've never seen blue dice so inconsistent throughout the like my time playing as it was in worlds yeah um and that was like for me and, and my opponents it was just the blue dice are wild um and then round three um round three was against a republic double venator luminara list and uh he had bid and he brought blockade run which I don't know if you guys have seen how the tables were set up at Worlds, but uh, playing Blockade Run was the most physically strenuous thing that I did that whole weekend. But it was really fun. 
I ended up winning that out of like once once you take out the Luminara expert shield tech thing, then squadrons kind of just shred the stuff. And then my final round was against the Garm list, and uh, I couldn't kill any of his squadrons, and so I just took out one assault frigate and we ran away. Like he took out my uh, GR seventy five. It was like a super cagey list. We knew that we just needed a six to get into day two. Uh, and so we were both playing for that six. Um, and I ended up just a few points on top. That's pretty awesome. I um, was wondering, I mean, looking at how, what you ran into, like, do you feel like your fleet archetype was right for you? I mean, like, there's always going to be matchup issues and stuff like that. But just like with what you ended up facing, did you feel like what you brought was a good kind of tournament all comers. This this isn't so niche that it can't respond. Did you feel pretty happy with how, what you're able to do with y'all's fleets? I feel like my list was strong. Um, if I had to go back and make some changes, I definitely would have made some. I would have switched around some of the squadrons that I brought. Um, I had a lot of like stally stuff. Like I brought Shara and Tycho, who are really good at keeping the opponent's squadrons away from whatever you're trying to do for a little while, but they don't really lack, uh, they don't really have any killing power, uh, especially with the way that I was rolling. Um, and so I really, the, the one thing that I would have liked to have had is some kind of killy squadron that could like punch through their Merrick or Jendon or Vader or whatever, and then have that piece stop adding damage to my things. Right. Um, but other than that, I, I think that the archetype that I brought is just kind of a strong two-day or three-day tournament type of thing. Uh, I learned a lot from just kind of watching uh, uh, Angry Ewok. He brought and has been bringing uh, Akbar list for a really long time that... It doesn't use the same farming objectives that I do, but it's it's pretty similar. Where he'll just either force you to come into his kill box, or he'll you know just take points from farming a little bit, and he'll get the seven and run away. Uh, and so I was kind of just like, my goal is to make day two. I don't really need any huge wins to do that. I'm gonna go for the sevens. And Drew, how about you? You know, with with the experience overall, do you feel like you're fleet um was the right choice would you make any any changes uh yeah i so you and i actually got a chance to play at osmo mm -hmm. and uh it was four rounds day one and then three rounds day two i think you and i played day one and you were my only loss um that weekend because you were second player and you just ran from me. Yep. <laughs> and so it was a six five zero zero MOV. Um and then at Worlds I I didn't have a bid. I changed so the Osmo list was a ten point bid and then I changed up the list and I, I had zero point bid. And my thought was um I don't mind going second because then we play my objectives and you don't want me to go first because then I get to repair. But what I overlooked was other people playing their objectives and, like I said, being cagey and just farming. Uh, we don't really do that in the Texas meta too much. So I didn't have too much experience against that. So I think if you're going to go to Worlds, you have to either have a bid or have a fleet that can exert pressure and speed two peltas are the antithesis of being able to exert pressure. So that's where I kind of shot myself in the foot of not having a bid. That makes sense. Um, yeah. And just, I mean, just for clarification, when we ran into each other at Osmo, the reason I ran is because you brought uh, another fleet I wasn't terribly familiar with. And I had learned my lesson at LSO prior to that when I ran into, was it the Ularn meat grinder? Oh yeah. And I underestimated that <laughs> to my, to my detriment at the worst possible time. So yeah, I think, you know, your, your fleets are really interesting to approach and I do like the puzzle that they present. Um, but yeah, running into a, something that you brought blindly once uh, just did make me a little bit more cagey facing it that second time. So yeah, I understand what you mean though, is that the, the Peltas, while they are tanky and kind of 
or this slow marching thing coming at you, it's hard to exert that pressure that you're talking about. Absolutely. Yeah. And I meant no, no shade at all from Osmo. You, you engaged and then, uh, you, you hit the peltas and then the peltas just repaired and you're like, yeah, I'm, I'm not doing that. So I'll, I'll take the win. I, it was a smart play. I, I think, cause I think if you had stuck around, the peltas would have rolled over your squads and maybe even your ships. So, yeah, no, I, I sent that little, that little feeler out. Yeah. I was like, oh, that's a terrible idea. <laughs> yeah. Bodie, you made it to day two. How was that experience? Uh, did you think the competition was more stiff, or did, was there some change in the meta, do you think? Um, the competition was a little different. Um, I really don't want to sound like I'm degrading anybody or making anyone feel like a bad player, because everybody in the room on day one are like the best armada players that I've ever seen. Uh, and the the interesting thing, I guess, between day one and day two is that the people who are in the room on day two were the ones who were either really lucky or know what they're doing, like, experience-wise, but really, really well. And I guess I was fortunate enough to have not really encountered the people who know what they're doing really, really well. And like, I, I really don't want to sound like I'm making anyone feel like a bad player because every all of my opponents are fantastic. Um, but day two, I started out against another Kraken, like rogue list. And uh, this time he had the bid and took second player. And uh, like literally we had no ship shots actually fired at each other. It was just his squadrons came in and decimated mine. And then he took the eight, you know, from just killing my squadrons and left. Uh, his CR-90s were way too fast for me to catch up to, even with my own CR-90s. Um, but uh, I kind of figured that would be the case, and it was just going to come down to the squad war, which he ended up going out on top of. Um, in round two, I ended up playing against the same Piet list from day one. And... Um, that time I had learned my lesson. I took second player and uh, I just farmed like a million points off of SensorNet. And um, I got an eight, I think. It was either an eight or a nine. Then in game three, I played against that MSU Sloan list with the Gladiators. Uh, and that list was really interesting. The only reason that I won is because on a shot that we had to call a judge over to get the measurement. Like it was millimeters away uh, on his quasar. And I needed to get five damage and an accuracy on my four red dice. And I got that. Uh, and I had TRC for like one of the doubles, but still it was the, the dice roll to end all dice rolls. And I ended up tabling him because of it. That's awesome. Yeah, and it is one of those things where it kind of feels bad because it's like I should not have been able to do that, but I did the thing, um, and you know I'll, I'll take the win, I guess. Um, but then I, after round three, I'm sitting at a solid twenty tournament points, uh, which the cutoff was about twenty five, twenty six, and uh, I met my round four opponent, who is the current Vassal World Cup champion. And all of my hopes and dreams of making day three kind of just faded. <laughs> if I had known that I could have made it into day three by taking a five loss, then I probably would have just run. I didn't know that, and so I figured that I would have to get the six like I did in day one. And um, his squadrons were, you know, they had more killing power than mine, and... I just targeted his ISD. He had chosen my advanced gunnery. And I was like, if I can take out the ISD, then we're good. Uh, and I would love to say that it limped away on two health, but it like Ozzel jettisoned away at speed three at two health. So it's not really the same thing. Uh, but we had a great game. Uh, we were laughing the whole time. 
and, and that was the case in most of my games. I met a lot of fantastic people, but uh, unfortunately, my world's run ended there. But I did play in the team's tournament on day three, and that was a lot of fun. I had a, a team we met online, kind of just one person was looking for three teammates. Um, that was Matt, uh, Danger Panda on the Discord. And so me and two others answered his call. And uh, we had Relent from, uh, he's from Australia. And then we had Laugh Fuzzball, who's from Atlanta. And uh, we were Team Pop-Tarts. Uh, the, the Tarts is like an acronym for the commanders we played. The guy was Republic Tarkin, and there's the TA. Uh, but we had a great time. Uh, we ended up getting sixth place in the teams, which was pretty neat. Uh, we had pizza one night. It was awesome. Sounds like an excellent, excellent experience. Uh, how about you, Texas Tony Badger? What was your day two and three experience like, and what was the community and atmosphere? Yeah, so um, I'm actually going to back up to day zero uh, during the world qualifier or the last chance qualifier. Um, I played in the uh, task force games and I borrowed uh, a list from Steve, who's a local there in Chicago. He had a list for task force and he didn't end up playing. And um, so I had a lot of fun. I played against uh, Reese from the UK and also uh, James, the he was the current world champion at that time from the UK, uh, Malador. Um, so that was a lot of fun. And then I found out early on in the tournament that I left my deck box that had all of my cards that I needed for the weekend at uh, home. And so I just sent out an SOS to the Discord and just want to you know say thank you to everyone who came through and let me borrow cards um you know royce and his dad rob uh from wisconsin they let me borrow some cards austin or mike from austin let me borrow some uh i think bodie you let me one or two um but everybody just jumped on it like yeah man i got you here you go uh steve uh that i mentioned earlier from chicago let me some cards and so uh Definitely quelled the panic real quick. Um, for day two, I played Sector Fleet. I played um, Pizza Party, but it was 800 points. So, and we're in Chicago, so I called it a deep dish. It was six victories and two venators and a consular lifeboat. And it was a lot of fun. They all have spats. Um, the victories ha or the venators have take evasive action and intensify firepower. And I love my pizza party list and to play it in sector fleet. It was just awesome. I played, um, an SSD, the first round, one of the bigger ones, the executor and got the table there. And then the second round I played against, um, three pickles and three shrimps, the, an Akbar fleet and, I was, I think, one health away from the table, which would have given me the win for the tournament. But I ended up with 19 tournament points, and someone had 19, but they beat me out on MOV. So, but it, it was a ton of fun. Uh, day three, I played in the team tournament with uh, Mike and your two guests from last week. Um, we had a little Texas team going on, and that was great. Uh, Austin was our captain, and Ryan played with the SSD and um, had a lot of fun. I played. Uh, we ended up playing the other Texas team, which uh, kind of was unfortunate because it's like you drive all that way and you play people that you can play with down the street. But uh, it was still fun. I played Downsize It, who I've played in two or three different tournaments also and been to his Osmo tournament, but that was fun. And it was just a great time. A lot of, a lot of Armada, a lot of hanging out. It was like, you know, a, a month and a half or two months worth of Armada in one weekend. And it was great. That's awesome. That's cool. Yeah. I honestly, I hear the same thing about the Armada community wherever I go. It's like people, Love to play. People love to share the game. People love to have fun rolling dice with one another. I think every now and then, there's you get you have an experience where it feels a little bad, but uh, most people shrug it off and then move on. 
because it's just a game. But uh, it's the best game. <laughs> Big agree. <laughs> Agreed. Do you guys have any uh, personal highlights from Worlds? Man, that's like the hardest question of this whole evening. I, I was so excited, you know, ever since I got my invite. Uh, I mean, just absolutely ecstatic. And the whole way home and in the last two, three weeks, I've just been completely giddy. Uh, like, I wish that I could just relive the weekend over and over again. I've met so many fantastic people that I've only experienced the glory of their messages online. And I got to see them in person and shake hands with them and play against some of them. And it, I'll go on and on about how great it was until next year. Yeah, I, it was great. Um, I'm glad my wife came along. Uh, she came and, you know, hung out and supported me. Uh, it was just really cool. The other people that brought their family to uh, Relent, that Bodhi talked about earlier from Australia, um, brought his mom and we stayed at the same hotel. So we had breakfast together most mornings uh, and then walked over to the convention together. That was really cool. Uh, Paul, his wife dressed up. Uh, she was in an Izard outfit one day because he was playing Imperials. And then the next day he was playing Rebels and she was dressed up as Princess Leia from Hoth. And, you know, like her card, that was really cool. Uh, meeting a whole bunch of people, like I said, forgetting my cards and then just having so many people willing to, you know, let me borrow stuff. And I made sure I got all their stuff back. Um, really, I think the one thing that was a highlight, and this might sound like a humble brag, and I don't mean it to at all, but it, it truly was the highlight of my weekend, was uh, it was Sunday during the team tournament. My last opponent was uh, Ben, downsize it. He was playing Thrawn like he always does. And we we wrapped up, and we were hanging out. We were chatting. I had a whole bunch of tickets. Uh, I bought all the dice I wanted, and I had just enough for the, the Thrawn mat. And so I went and bought the Thrawn mat because that was the coolest thing left. Like, I was asking, what should I buy? You know, and I asked, like, Tater, hey, what should I buy? He's like, oh, that Thrawn mat's awesome. I'm like, what am I going to do with that? He's like, you're going to put it up on your wall. It's a great decoration. So I was like, yeah, maybe, whatever. So I looked. I, I wanted the rulers. I had enough for the rulers, but they were kind of janky, to be honest. And I didn't end up getting those. So I just bought the Thrawn mat and a bunch of dice. And then I got back to the table, and I was sitting across from Ben, who always plays Thrawn. He loves Thrawn. And I asked him, I was like, how many tickets do you have left? And I was just going to you know, kind of cheekily uh, offer him the Thrawn mat for however many tickets he had left because... I didn't think he had enough to get it. And he said um, that he'd given all his tickets to Bodhi. And, uh, you know, I just saw Ben, who is a great guy. He is so selfless. Uh, he does a lot for the community. He posts his videos. He posts his updates. He's always positive. Um, and he, I feel like he does it for the community. He, he doesn't do it for himself. And so I was like, hey, man, you like Thrawn? Take this Thrawn mat. And I just gave it to him. And his face just lit up. It, it was the coolest reaction that I can remember ever giving someone something. He was so happy. He's like, man, I got to find a way to repay you. I was like, you don't have to repay me. It, you like Thrawn. Like, this is your thing. And uh, he was cheesing. He was smiling. My wife was cheesing and smiling. And it was a it was a really great moment for me to be able to give back to somebody who really gives so much to the community. Um, that was the highlight of my weekend by far. And then I didn't even know it, but he made a video like that night and gave me a huge shout out and showed the mat and thanked me and everything. And uh, we were talking about what we bought with the tickets in the Discord, and I was like, oh yeah, I didn't really want the rulers, so I ended up buying the Thrawn mat and. And somebody was like, oh, didn't you give that to Ben? Like, because they had seen the video. And I was like, yeah, I did. But so that was cool that it, that kind of got around real quick, too. Um, but it, it wasn't something I planned to do. And it wasn't something that, you know, was it was just kind of spur of the moment. It was just the right, right place, right time, right people. And it was really cool. That's fantastic. And that, I think, um, is a, a theme we see a lot. In Armada, it's what I mean. As cool as the game is, as much as I love it, um, the community 
that has come together around this game, I think is exceptional, especially from what I've seen, like observing, you know, other games in the competitive, especially in the competitive setting. It's just everybody seems to have the right approach. Like you said, Drew, it's very generous. I could speak to the same thing, uh, seeing that generosity uh, time and again. And I think I know the answer to this question, but uh, I'm going to go ahead and ask it. Would you go again if you had the opportunity? And now that you've been, what advice do you have for players who want to make it to Worlds for the first time? Uh, yeah, I, I think I'd go again. Um, like I said, it was like two months worth of Armada, maybe even more than that, packed into one weekend. There was a lot of stuff to do, a lot of people to see. Um, Shout out to Reese again from the UK who passed out um, a bunch of uh, alt art cards that another member from the UK, Chris, uh, created. They're absolutely beautiful cards. He, they just he just went by and whatever fleet you had uh, that you were flying, he gave you a couple of alt arts that Chris made. And Chris just makes them out of his own pocket and, and gives them out. So... Um, just stuff like that, that, you know, you meet people from all over the world and you, you get this camaraderie and everything. And I, I, I like all the Texas people. Um, but at the same time, I didn't want to just, you know, go to dinner with Texas people every night because I wanted to hang out with some of the other people that I don't get to see, you know, several times a year. Um, so I, I yeah, I would, I'd go again. Um, as far as advice, this is going to sound redundant, but I mean, this is what I wrote down earlier this afternoon uh, to answer this question of uh, advice to new players who want to make it to Worlds. Go for the community, not the tournament. If if you're competitive and you want to do well, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with making it to day two, making it to day three, winning Worlds. All that stuff is awesome. But I don't even think that should be your goal. Uh, and I think you could kind of see it. The people who that was their goal, they were missing out on the experience. They got burnt out. And whenever they were knocked out of the tournament, they had to go and do something else and, you know, unwind or whatever. And uh, the people that were there that were just so focused on winning, which was very few and far between. Um, but, you know, there were some instances of maybe a little poor sportsmanship or, Howdy when the dice didn't go your way, uh, which is perfectly natural and fine. But I played against players who, you know, they'd have a bad role and they're like, whatever. I'm here in Chicago with friends playing Armada. It doesn't get much better than that. So uh, that would be my advice is is to go for the experience. Um, and I think Bodhi said it earlier to to make day two, to make day three, to win, it takes an incredible amount of skill. You have to be very good at Armada to do that, but it also takes a lot of luck. It takes a lot of luck in the RNG during match or during your games and in getting the right matchups to make it that far. And so mm -hmm. the people who do advance are incredible Armada players, but they're in some ways the luckiest of the really good Armada, Armada players also. Um, now, don't come at me <laughs> saying I'm taking anything <laughs> away because they're, they're really no. good Armada players. I'm not taking anything away from that. But um, that's, why you, that's why you get such a diversity in, in the top eight every year. You know, it, there are some people you expect to do well, and then there are some people that surprise you. Yeah. yeah I, May I jump in here real yeah. quick? Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I would ag agree with uh, Honey Badger here. I think uh, the atmosphere at Worlds is very much a, it's more of like a fan spectator atmosphere where you get to cheer on all these people who are performing and trying to do their best and you get to watch some great Armada being played. So uh, like in that regard, it's a great experience for that. And the number of people that are actually going to make it to day two, day three, it gets smaller and smaller. And so they get more and more fans surrounding them. So, uh, yeah, definitely go if you have the chance. Um, let's see. Um, I also wanted to say, 
we have been harping on how good the community is. Obviously, we're all human, and there are going to be uh, human experiences where you have uh, like bad die rolls or something. But I, I really don't want to go back to the comments from this podcast and have people pointing fingers saying Armada is not a good community because of this one person or that one person, this one experience I had. It's true that like there are people do have bad experiences from day to day. So, uh, but as a whole, I think this community has a much better batting average for uh, positive attitudes rather than negative. Oh, I yeah, I would agree wholeheartedly. They're pretty far and few between. And I think Drew, you made a lot of a good points um, in what you were saying about matchups, the kind of the, the, the luck aspect, and then just the skill aspect. Um, and then something else I, you know, with, with, with both of you, um, you know, it's just like to touch back on, on your, your game playing experience, uh, at worlds, um, was there a noticeable shift in your demeanor? uh when you're out of the competition drew and then Bodhi, did you feel more pressure on day two than you did on day one now that you had kind of gotten a bit further and either one of you can can pick that i'm just kind of curious like drew you you've struck me as kind of a relaxed guy most of the time anyway so like was it all all great the whole experience all gravy for you or did it get noticeably lighter after day one yeah i mean i i didn't expect to make day two um i i've had a lot of success in the texas meta in the last competitive season especially being my first competitive season um but i don't think like i'm i'm the texas champion but i don't think i'm the best player in texas by any means i think i greatly benefited from some of that matchup luck we're talking about, some of that luck along the way. I can think about, you know, different games that could have gone a lot different had the dice landed a little differently. Or uh, LSO, when I won my ticket, um, you know, I took a 3-8 loss, and that put me at the bottom, and we had a drop, and so I got a buy. So I got a free 8-3 the second uh, round, and then... Um, I won my last game and it just barely edged me into fourth place. So that's, that's how I got my ticket. I mean, that's kind of lucky, um, to, to get a buy and a free eight. So to completely make up for my first round loss. So, um, I, I didn't expect to make day two. I didn't make day two. Uh, I was prepared for it. I wanted to, um, but you know, I, I just don't think. Uh, I would have needed luck to make day two. I don't think I'm quite good enough to and quite uh, would have deserved it. And so, um, and playing like Sector Fleet was a lot of fun. There was absolutely no pressure to make day two because there's still other stuff to do. The only downside is you you have to pay a little bit for it. You know, you had to pay an extra $15 to play in the sure. Sector Fleet tournament or whatever. Um, but, uh no, it, it, the people that I talked to that did make day two, like we went to dinner and they're like, oh, I got to go, you know, get a good night's sleep and got to go play competitive Armada the next day. I almost didn't even envy them at that point because it's like, well, I'm, I'm going to have a few beers and I'm going to, you know, show up at the start time, which is an hour later than yours and <laughs> just take it easy. Yeah. No, that, yeah, that's. I think that's some good insight uh, on kind of the mentality that goes into things, especially on day two. And so Bodhi, that kind of leads into your experience. Yeah. Did, was, did you feel more pressure on day two than you did on day one? So at the exact same dinner where uh, Drew got to have his couple of beers, I was like, oh my gosh, I made day two. My plan, by the way, I brought Twilight Imperium. Uh, which is like one of the best board games. And I was going to assemble a group of people who didn't make day two, assuming I don't like to, to play a different game. Um, yeah, I was lucky enough, fortunate enough uh, to make it in. And the only time that I felt 
even the slightest bit of anxiety was like it, it, there's there's like this focal point in a game where you know that it's been taken away from you and that might be a ship going down a little bit sooner than you thought it might be or, or even losing a squadron and it was Mark Welder's ISD activation where he just shredded all of my A-wings and then got to move them towards my ships that I knew that I had to start like running away from um, and it was like that moment it's like well you know that's it and then I just enjoyed the rest of the game like uh, there was there was pressure sure but I mean I was just having a great time you know playing with people that I can say are my friends now and that's just yeah. so awesome to me that's fantastic um you know i you asked earlier would you go again and advice to give and yeah. I'm, I'm gonna be hunting down next year's invite uh with renewed vigor <laughs> um i even if i don't get one i'm going to try and just go to hang out and do side events um as for advice like i don't know if if you guys are family friendly then bleep this out but just get your <laughs> ass kicked um you know when i was learning the game i was learning with someone who was also learning the game and so we learned together but some people are learning the game from people who already know the game and in those situations you're gonna lose a lot and when i teach people i like explicitly tell them you know don't take these games as gospel truth uh, you have to accept that you know the way to remember these rules interactions because there's a lot of them and the ways to improve your flying is by experiencing it over and over again and you'll learn more if you lose um now it feels really good to win and you should definitely try and do that too um but I mean, Drew mentioned it earlier, like, don't go and try and win. Just, like, go and play the game. It's fun. Like, do that. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I... A lot of what y'all said echoes some of the experiences I had in the past at LSO, where on day one, I'd never done that well. Hit that lovely flow state where dice are working for you and matchups are, you know, even if not favorable. Um, and I was relaxed. And then day two, didn't get enough sleep, was nervous, anxiety built up. So yeah, I think, you know, it's it's one of those things where it's really easy to get in your head with anything that's competitive, um, which is what makes, again, to kind of circle back to the community aspect of it, which is what makes the community, I think, overall so healthy is that uh, even when you're feeling anxious, um, or having a, a rough time with die rolls or, you know, you make a bad decision. I I cannot think of a single time where an opponent used that, you know, to uh, to leverage and wasn't just like, oh, sorry. You know, it's like, and it's genuine, sorry, that was a bad roll, you know. And so that kind of thing kind of, uh, I think, is what helps overall in the game. Um, so my last question um is in your relatively new experience in the community something that we've struggled with in the dfw area i think for a number of reasons but primarily due to the size and how spread out people are um what do you see as the biggest things a community um, can do to support the development of the player base and really keep enthusiasm going um, attract new players like what what have you seen work in your experiences i think that ueas are a perfect example of what to do and that's making content or just like making things for this game i i hear so many interviews on podcasts uh, and a lot of the times people say i got into the game because i watched crabock or i on radio or downsize mm -hmm. it and like those are kind of the pinnacle of people who have money to afford nice like recording setups um but i mean we're here making this podcast and 
I don't know, my mic is not super nice. Like it, it's just one that I bought when I built my PC, you know? Um, there are so many fantastic YouTube channels uh, like Mercier, uh, Fly Casual. Um, there's like a Polish one as well, and they'll live stream their tournaments. Um, there's a, cute, a couple other people who post uh, like actual battle reports and things. But go and support these people and uh, seek them out. And, you know, if you're feeling a little feisty, go and make your own. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and, and even if you're just watching Downsize It's Battle Reports, you know, he's popular. Hell, I'm even on there. If you want to go and see my ugly mug, great. But, like, support the content we have. There's not a lot of it. And if you want to, make some yourself. I, I agree. And, and um, Drew, just real quick before you jump in, I did want to, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, Bodhi, because yeah, I think the the online the content that's out there in the community, all the people that you just mentioned, the Armada podcast, the Can't Get Your Ship Out guys, um, Tater through the work that he does. I mean, this this community is what has really sustained the game um, in what are admittedly sometimes lean times in terms of product and stuff like that. Um, so again, uh, coming back to the community, yeah, the shout out to everybody. Who has done so much to maintain this game uh, over time and i'm and josh you know thank you for doing this i think it's helping maybe bring the dfw area together a little bit and uh i think it's good a good step to take for us here drew what about you what what do you see is contributing to the health of a, of a community and developing that player base yeah i i agree with everything Bodie said and uh i also want to um mentioned something, Steve, uh, that I talked about earlier, Steve, uh, from Chicago mentioned whenever they get new players, um, they bring them in and they play a game and they just kind of let them win and get them excited about the game. Uh, whenever I fly, fly against a new player, I try to bring stuff. I don't necessarily let them win. Um, I try to bring stuff that they can kill, stuff that's they're going to be able to shoot and get off the board because um, that's the fun part, right? And so if you can get them hooked, then you can teach them the game and then get them to keep coming back. Uh, so I think getting, you know, don't play KG, don't play farming objectives, just front to enemy, roll lots of dice, blow stuff up, get it off the board. Uh, so that's how you get them hooked. And then two, I think coaching. Um, one of the guys in San Antonio, he, he's moved away now, I think in Iowa or Ohio somewhere, uh, Nick Bonner is the guy who has taught me the absolute most from about Armada and how to play. Uh, and I have, I think we'd played maybe half a dozen, 10 games or so, uh, before he beat me for the first time. And maybe part of that was, you know, the letting me win, getting me hooked on it. Um, but he taught me the game really well. And part of that was just coaching me through games and telling me, you know, Hey, I think this is probably a better decision because, and I, uh, Armada is a hard game to learn. You play for two hours, three hours, and it's a very small sample size, six rounds, very few engagements, one costly mistake uh, can be overlooked and you don't even realize you made a mistake, but you know, so many different aspects of the game from squadron play to token management to objective play. How many times have we said we've lost a game at deployment? <laughs> there, there are so many things in the game that can make you lose a game and you don't always notice them. And I think having a coach that can point those out to you of, hey, that's actually a mistake and here's why, can help you learn. There's a spectrum of, of learning where you go from unconscious incompetence to just you don't know where you're doing, you don't know what you're doing and you don't know why you don't know what you're doing um, to conscious, unconscious competence to where you're doing everything right and you don't even have to think about it. And there's a, 
a spectrum there of, you know, conscious incompetence where you know what you're doing wrong and so you can fix it to conscious competence to where you know what you're doing right, but you really have to think about it and make those right decisions. Um, and so I would, I'd like to see more coaching in the game. I would really like to see maybe a partner's tournament where you pair, uh, like a more experienced player with a less experienced player and, um, kind of, they just give them feedback, uh, of this is what you, you know, I wouldn't do this because of that, um, and you let them play. You don't make any decisions for them, but whenever they're kind of making bad decisions, you step in. Yeah, I think that's I think that's a really good idea. I would agree with that, and that actually uh, is kind of one aspect of the development league that I'm trying to put together here in the DFW area. Um, I don't think it's implementable in the first season, but after the first season, when we have some rankings. I'd like to pair up uh, A bracket players with B bracket players, and then that way they can go through the season and be a pair, and then give each other feedback on how their fleet's doing, how they can improve, and how to play the game better. So I think that development, like that's a really good, uh, a really good vehicle for development. Yeah, that, I'm really looking forward to putting that together, but I think that'll have to be in the second year of its life. Yeah, I think. Uh... You know, studies show that the best way to learn something is to teach it. And so if you're a good player and you want to take the next step and be a better player, get some people under your wing and teach them how to play and you'll learn even more aspects. And then on the flip side, you know, if you're trying to get better, get a mentor, uh, you know, shameless plug. If anybody's looking to teach me how to be better, <laughs> I'd love to learn. I'd love to learn how to play Rebels because I completely suck at them. I'd lo love to learn how to play squads. I'm not a great squad player, but uh, I, I think we have a great community that's prime for that kind of stuff. You you see it with like Jackson and um, Andy and, and Mac who were talking about the shadow meta because that was just guys that were playing and giving each other constant feedback of how to get better. And I think that really helps you elevate your game if you are looking to get better. Drew brought up two things, uh, just real quick. I am now aware, and I had seen this as I was looking at the lists across T4, and uh, had talked with Fox about this. I was like, "What is this? I keep seeing this. It's like a big, and then a, a flotilla, and something like Gladiator, your uh, your hound dog, uh, and then just as many squadrons as you can fit in. So this basic three ship meta. And Fox told me that that oh yeah, that's the shadow meta or <laughs> i i am i am curious to see how that plays out i didn't realize there was such a storied past behind them working that out together but um it got me thinking about uh if there is a rebel version of that out there i don't know yet the only other thing that i would say uh that drew is you're 100 percent correct on on the teaching experience and uh what i've learned with new players is just to be real up front and it's just like, you know, look, I can I can talk as much or as little as you need me to and just try to like read the situation because, you know, you don't want to over talk on somebody, you know, um, and over coach when all they're looking for is maybe that first experience of like, hey, that was a solid win. That's what it feels like to blow up a ship. And so like kind of having that awareness that you were mentioning of um, of kind of cultivating uh, a relationship and a new player and getting them into the game. Um, you know, putting away the farm hawk list for the night. And, all right, let's just run, you know, a couple CR90s and some X-Wings, you know, and just uh, having that be the long-term goal. But listening um, and, you know, not not over overwhelming a new player with all the minutiae, because it is a lot. There's a steep learning curve. So especially now with as many waves of release as there are, there's a lot to remember. So that's all very good advice. And it's stuff that I know we're trying to do up here in the DFW area for sure. Awesome. All right. Well, that brings us to the end of our podcast where we talk about what errata we would like to see. This is the elevated section. Uh, it's not necessarily errata, but changes we think would make the game more playable for things that don't get enough action. So I'll start off by saying that uh, I was originally going to choose one aspect of Armada to 
uh, elevate, but instead, I'd like to talk, since we talked about this earlier in the podcast, a little bit about Anakin or Commanderkin. And I had a suggestion or a, like a homebrew build that was similar to Anakin um, before he, I think it was before he came out, actually. Um, the idea was you'll have a commander and then you'll have a salvo token on that card. And then anytime during the round when a ship is making an attack, you can spend that token during the attack to include all of the rear dice pools of ships within range. And then that way you have something that is uh, like a haymaker without having to line up a shot necessarily. And I think that actually would be more in line with what Anakin was when he first came out uh, and may be a better errata change that might make him and the Gar faction feel like they've got some uh, weight to them. So that's my idea. Um, of course, that would that would take into account the like obstruction and ranges. I'll go next. Who can tell me what the YV666 squadron does? It's got rogue. It's got rogue. rogue. <laughs> rogue. Alright, here's the proposed change. We take away the Empire symbol and we change it to the Separatist symbol. Alright, this is going to do three things. First up, Separatists have rogue. Now they're cool. Second, uh, now the people who are hating on Morallo don't have to worry about it because Morallo is also in a YV666. Third thing, now we have a seven health squadron for Separatists. And what's that, what that's going to do is let us use our red flag and we're going to put uh, Ruthless Strategist on it all day long and it's going to be the next best thing. That's, that's the whole point. I like it. I w- I'm a little scared about the seven hole going to the CIS, but <laughs> there's speed too. There's there are speed, speed too. Yeah. I'm not it's against it. It's going to take forever for them to get there, but once they do, the flat game is going to be great. All right. Cool, cool, cool. Honey Badger, you want to go next? Yeah. Um, so you want the short answer or the long answer? I'm just Whatever kidding, answer you got. Short answer. <laughs> okay, <laughs> fine. Uh, so. Uh, one card I would pick to elevate would be Oddball. Um, he's so expensive. He, you know, doesn't really do a cool ability. Uh, I think the way I would change him is I'd get rid of his evade. It's stupid. Give him two braces. Um, I would change his battery to a blue black instead of a double blue, and I would change his ability to um, whenever he activates. He can move distance one even if he's engaged. And so you've got a speed two bomber with quasi rogue. Um, and he can, he's hard to tie down, but he's not impossible because it's only distance one that he can move. Uh, so you can still screen your uh, ships. But I think that that would really elevate him and keep him the same points. I mean, 23 points is a lot for a squad. So that's what I would do to change him. But the long answer is um, going back to what Bodhi said earlier about introducing new concepts. And, you know, I don't know if any of y'all play like magic, the gathering, but magic does this extremely well where they come out with new sets and they, all the new sets have a new ability. It does something different. Um, so I'd flesh out and the way to start is flesh out the clones and the droid keywords, the civil war factions are underutilized. I would like to, you know, you're going to get the knee jerk reaction of, Oh, they're too good. They're overpowered. Well, when they start seeing 40 and 30% or 50% play at world competitions and the Imperial Imperial and rebels go down to, you know, single digits or low double digits, um, then maybe we can look at readjusting them. But until then, yeah, flesh out the droids and the clones, give them some cool abilities, uh, give them some unique things, maybe some commanders or some officers that impact all droid squadrons or all clone ships or whatever it may be, and give them some synergy. I think that's the easiest way to really elevate those uh, ships out there. I like that. I do think it's a good idea to kind of beef up the Clone Wars factions 
not only because they don't have much to go on right now, but if you're a younger player getting into Star Wars, the Clone Wars is kind of what you grew up with, like you said earlier. So if you jump into the game and then you realize, oh, the stuff I know and love, it's not that good or it's not that competitive at the moment, then uh, it's kind of a turn off, I guess, to the game. But let's wrap up the elevated section with Chris. The one addition that I've always wanted to see in the game that I think would be relatively easy to implement um, would be the addition of um, officer cards on squadrons uh, or upgrades that you could put on your squadrons that would count towards your squadron total. So, you know, something like put an R, you know, you could have generic stuff, like put an R2 unit on a, on an X-Wing and it gives it, um, you know, a one-time use, like a temporary uh, effect, you know, add a die or go one, one speed faster. Um, you know, relatively cheap, disposable, generic stuff like that. But then we would finally have an opportunity to see, you know, First Mate Chewie or R2-D2 or C-3PO. And while some of these elements might be present in other games like X-Wing, I think it would be a fairly affordable way to, to spice things up in the, in the squadron play. Although, if you already don't like squadron play, if it already feels too slow, I can see how it might be a down. I actually really like that idea. And I'll tell you why. I would like to see it expanded upon to where you have uh, each pilot can go into kind of like an X-Wing can go into any hole, but they keep the same defense tokens unless it's egregious. Like if it's Shara going into a YT-1300, that would be too much. Maybe the tokens have to fit based on the, the ship, but um, <laughs> I'm seeing the, the chat. Yeah, I I went a little too far right there for a moment. Uh, <laughs> okay, but uh, yeah, I think the idea of, there's already Anakin in a, a Y-Wing, there's already Anakin in a Delta, so why not just flip him into an arc as well or something? So have him keep one of the abilities. Maybe it's too much, Maybe it's not, but it sounds like a fun idea. I like the idea of an ace ability. Um, you know, I think maybe the defense token should stick with their ships. Uh, whatever ship has that, if it has an ace in it, that's going to have the defense tokens no matter which ace is in it. Um, that way you don't get scatters in defenders, tie defenders. But uh, yeah, the, the ace that switches to another ship, it keeps its ability. I think that would be kind of cool, actually. Okay. That wraps up our podcast. I do want to give one more shout out. I forgot about last week, but Bodie did mention them. Mars from Fly Casual last year gave me some cards and I got to talk to him for a bit. But yeah, support your uh, community locally and support your creators. And in saying that, give this video or podcast a like and subscribe on YouTube if you get the chance. Or if you're listening somewhere else, if you can leave a comment or interact in some way. That'd be great. In the DFW area this weekend, we have a tournament at Texas Toy Soldier, which, what time is that at, Chris? We're looking at a, they open at 10, so it's a casual Saturday. Um, looking to have dice drop by 1045, hopefully. Do three rounds. Awesome. All right. We realize this is uh, kind of a longer podcast, but... Uh, if you need to take a break, I'm glad you did and stick it out and uh, listen to all of it. And thank you. Until next time, <laughs> like downsizing Bye. does, take it easy. <laughs> take it easy. <laughs> Everyone be safe.